Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, episode 3.30, A European War. Welcome back. Before we begin for today, I want to give you all an idea of where this podcast is heading over the remainder of this season. We are going to have several more episodes before we wrap up the French and Indian War. We have a lot more to cover and are around the halfway mark right now. Once that is complete, we are going to move into our standard two-episode season review, one where I look at the events that we have covered this season, and then another where I attempt to pull all those strings together and make sense of the entire thing. After that, I am planning an additional episode where we are going to look at everything that we have talked about thus far. We are approaching the end of one of the major eras in the history of the United States. Specifically, we are quickly coming upon the end of the colonial era. I am planning an episode that is going to look back over the entire colonial period and try to dissect what it has all meant. Though we are going to spend a good part of next season still dealing with the colonies, the imperial crisis marks its own distinct phase on the march towards eventual independence. Now, before we do that, I have one last episode that I'm going to do this season. Not that you've been counting, but our episode today is the 95th episode of this podcast. I believe that means, under standard podcasting convention, that I owe you all a Q&A episode. Now, unfortunately, this is not going to line up perfectly with episode 100. I've just got too much to still cover with the French and Indian War. But we should be relatively close. So with that, start thinking of questions that you've got. You can email them to me, and I'll include the show's email in my show notes today. Plus, it is on the website. You can also tweet questions to me, send them over Facebook, or by Carrier Pigeon. Regardless of how you get them to me, if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them during that episode. I assume some of these are going to take a bit of work to answer, so if you want to get a question to me, I'm going to leave this window open for a bit. When we get a bit closer to the end of this series on the French and Indian War, I'll give you guys a hard cutoff date of when I need the questions by. So, start thinking of questions and send me what you've got. However, for now, let's get back to the war. One thing that really does set the French and Indian War apart from other conflicts that we have talked about is its nature as an American conflict that spilled into Europe. Every other war and conflict has seen North America act as a small side theater in a much grander European war. However, the French and Indian War was one whose origins are grounded in North America. North America was not some minor theater to the real action in Europe, but rather it was a major part of that war. This is going to have interesting consequences which we are going to spend today talking about, as it is going to very much determine how the war plans were going to be carried out. By the time that we reach 1756, things will have spiraled into a full-fledged European war. Referred to as the Seven Years' War everywhere but in North America, this conflict would see fighting spanning from North America and the Caribbean to Europe and off into India. It was truly a global affair. We are going to then wrap up today by looking back towards North America to see if 1756 was going to be any kinder to the British than was 1755. As 1756 was ushered in, there was very little for the British to celebrate. The first year and a half of the war, from that very first firefight that resulted in the death of Jumonville to the campaigns of 1755, Acadia notwithstanding, had been a disaster for the British. The losses in North America were not lost on the British back in London, who were less than impressed at how the war effort was going. With Braddock dead and his army of regulars getting crushed, the command fell to William Shirley, who is at present holed up in Oswego, some 150 miles from his intended target of Niagara, a target that Shirley is never going to reach. We have already seen the tension between the provincial leadership and the British leadership. When General Braddock had come over, he had brought along with him clear notions and ideas about what warfare should look like. These goals, however, often clashed with the realities of North American warfare. The provincial officers may have lacked in the training and experience of the British regulars, 
However, they had important insights, not just into the state of warfare in North America, but also of the political realities involved. William Shirley, despite his other shortcomings, was keenly aware of what it was going to take to raise an army that could contend with the conflict at hand. Among the biggest problems for Shirley were a pair of proclamations regarding British policy. The first stated that provincial officers were going to be lower in rank than regular officers. This was a serious problem because it had the practical effect of weeding out all of the best-trained provincial officers for military service. Nobody climbing the ranks of provincial leadership had any interest in suddenly being subordinate to a junior officer. The provincial officers couldn't care less about how the British regulars got their commissions. For them, a military rank was just that, a military rank. For the provincial officers, it was a matter of respect. With provincial officers unwilling to accept the slight, it also made recruiting colonists to take part in the provincial army that much more difficult. Colonists wanted to serve under their own officers and had little desire to serve under actual regular British officers. This is something that would long grade at George Washington, who never lost the feelings of being insulted in this regard. The second problem is that London extended military discipline to everybody serving in the army, regular and provincial alike. This was a profoundly unpopular move amongst the provincial soldiers that made recruitment much more difficult. Under this program, the provincial soldiers would be required to uphold the same standards as the British regulars, which is something that just would not happen. Telling the provincials that even minor breaches in discipline was going to result in lashings was not exactly a popular recruiting slogan. These two programs are a good example of the lack of understanding that the British had over the political situation in the colonies. The British undeniably had reasons to pass these regulations. Regular officers were going to be better trained than their equivalent provincials. Provincial officers were not full-time soldiers, but they were called on to address a pressing need. The regulars, on the other hand, lived and breathed the army. From the British perspective, of course the provincial officers were not the same as regular officers. To suggest otherwise would be ludicrous. As to military discipline, of course you wanted uniform discipline across the entire army. That makes complete sense. Right up until the point when you realize that trying to get some Massachusetts farmer to head out and fight the French with minimal training, they are not going to easily adapt to the level of discipline that well-trained regulars can. So, while the British regulations were logical decisions that, on their face, completely made sense, they lacked insight into colonial affairs that would have informed them why this was going to be such a deeply unpopular thing amongst the North American provincials. William Shirley understood this. Shirley's solution was simple but efficient. Rather than having mixed armies of regulars and provincials, Shirley kept the two groups completely separated. Under his plan, the provincial officers would not have to worry about being outranked by a junior regular officer, because hey, they would not be around. Should the occasional slip in discipline take place, punishment would be left to the far less rigid colonial officers. There would be no need to run complaints into a full-fledged court-martial and dole out disciplines at the end of a whip. This was a popular policy with the colonial legislatures that were tasked with actually having to raise them in. Unfortunately for William Shirley, however, he is not without very significant political enemies. We discussed the back and forth between him and William Johnson last time, and the situation was not getting much better. With Shirley's failure to take Fort Niagara, or frankly even get close to the fort, men like Johnson smelled blood in the water. Shirley's star had dimmed significantly when it became clear that the Niagara expedition was going to stall out. William Johnson, on the other hand, had a few things going for him. London noticed the good relationship that he had with the Iroquois. The necessity of Indian alliances meant that Johnson was pretty safe in his position. Johnson had likewise done a pretty masterful job of spinning the previous year's defense of Lake George. Sure, Johnson did not actually reach his aim at Crown Point, 
but he managed to successfully spin his defensive victory as just that, a much-needed British victory during an otherwise bleak year. Johnson, already wanting Shirley gone, wasted no time in attacking the Massachusetts governor. Back in London, the Duke of Cumberland and Secretary of War Henry Fox, the two men who most controlled the war effort in Britain, agreed with Johnson's assessment. The war was not going well and Shirley lacked the military experience to execute it. All of this would combine to mark the end of William Shirley's time as the commander of the provincial army. However, it was not William Johnson who got control either, but it was the Earl of Loudoun, John Campbell. For William Shirley, this marked more than just the end of his command over the North American forces. It marked the end of his time in North America. Johnson and his associates had delivered such a stinging report about Shirley's conduct that he found himself also removed from his position as the governor of Massachusetts. Shirley was briefly replaced by Spencer Phipps, the adopted son of our old friend William Phipps. Spencer Phipps would die shortly thereafter, which would lead to Thomas Pownall taking over, with Thomas Hutchinson as the lieutenant governor. Shirley had continued to make plans for 1756, despite having learned that his time commanding the army was coming to a quick end. While he had detailed plans for a 1756 campaign, I'm not going to overload you guys with them. Why? Because Shirley at this point was a lame duck. Loudon would not arrive in the colony until July 23, 1756. However, his second in command, General James Abercrombie, had arrived about a month before and relieved Shirley of his command. What Abercrombie observed was what he considered to be a dumpster fire. Upon a review of the plans for the 1756 campaign, Abercrombie made the likely prudent decision to wait for his boss to arrive the following month. When Loudon saw Shirley's plans, he promptly scrapped them altogether. Loudon would not separate provincials and regulars. Why would he? The provincials were there to back up the regulars, and that is the way that it was going to be. Undoubtedly, Loudon was a vastly superior military commander than was Shirley, because Loudon had, you know, actual training. However, this brings us back to where we started today. While William Shirley had a lack of military acumen, he had a deep understanding of colonial politics. He knew what the colonial legislatures would endure and what they would balk at. As we are going to see, this is a skill that Loudon lacks. This would prove unfortunate because Loudon arrived in North America with sweeping powers. George II had given him powers akin to a viceroy, though it is worth noting that this was not an actual title conveyed to him. Practically speaking, however, Loudon was the most powerful man in the colonies, outranking everybody including the colonial governors. These broad powers put Loudon into direct conflict with colonial leaders and would help make him into a deeply unpopular figure. There is evidence that during the spring of 1756, there was a general optimism in London regarding Loudon and his mission in North America, despite the disaster that was 1755. Among those optimistic about the state of affairs heading into 1756 was a young, soon-to-be Pennsylvania lawyer named John Dickinson. Dickinson was born in Maryland in 1732, though he would spend most of his life in Pennsylvania and Delaware. Dickinson is going to be a major figure for us moving forward, beginning during the Imperial Crisis, running up through the Revolution, and on into the early Republic. In 1756, however, he was still just a 24-year-old law student, busy studying in London. With that being said, we know that Dickinson wrote to both his mother and brother frequently discussing the many advantages that the British held over the French. He informed them both about Britain's vastly superior navy and impressive army. He likewise wrote to them about how France was fighting a war without allies. As for his opinion on Loudoun, Dickinson wrote to his mother in March of 1756 that Loudoun having greatly distinguished himself, and he fills everybody with the greatest expectations. Dickinson said that he had sound judgment and a coolness about him. According to Dickinson, Loudon was the complete soldier. 
while Dickinson was still just a young law student. His opinions should certainly be considered for what they are. He was living in London at the time. He was presumably engaged in talk and debate about the ongoing war effort. We can therefore assume here that Dickinson's opinions are probably partially a reflection of others in London, those with whom Dickinson was hinking around with. His writings helped to establish that there was a general sense of optimism heading into 1756. Contrasting Dickinson would be the words of Benjamin Franklin, who wrote following the events that would come in 1757. Franklin, who was not really a huge fan of Loudon, wrote in his autobiography both his impressions of the man and his transition into power. I am going to quote a bit here because I think Franklin does a good job of giving a colonial perspective to the differences between Loudon and Shirley. Though, of course, we must keep in mind that he wrote this years after the fact, with the benefit of hindsight on just how the next two decades were going to turn out. Franklin wrote that. On the whole, I wondered much how such a man came to be entrusted with so important a business as the conduct of a great army. But having since seen more of the great world and the means of obtaining and motives for giving places and employments, my wonder is diminished. General Shirley, on whom the command of the army devolved upon the death of Braddock, would, in my opinion, if continued in place, have made a much better campaign than that of Loudon in 1757 which was frivolous, expensive, and disgraceful to our nation beyond conception. For though Shirley was not a bred soldier, he was sensible in himself and attentive to good advice from others, capable of forming judicious plans, quick and active in carrying them into execution. Franklin would write about the failings of Loudon and his policy. I'm omitting some of that today because it involves things that we have not yet talked about and won't be doing until at least next time. However, it is clear to see how Franklin views Loudon as compared to Shirley. Franklin, who by this point was deeply involved in colonial politics, was clearly able to see the failings of Loudon in his conduct leading the war. He acknowledged that Shirley was not a soldier, but there is an undeniable frustration towards the policies of Loudon. Now, again, to be fair, Franklin is writing all of this years and years after the fact, whereas the optimism that we see from Dickinson comes from letters that he wrote during the spring and early summer of 1756. Dickinson was lacking the hindsight that Franklin had when he wrote his autobiography. I quote both men rather to give some contrasting opinions towards Loudon. As we are going to see next time especially, Loudon's lack of awareness of colonial politics and frankly, even if he was aware of them, he certainly showed little interest in doing anything to acknowledge that power, is going to come to define his time in North America. It is the failure to understand and acknowledge the inner workings of colonial politics that is going to make Loudon a frustratingly ineffective leader. We will talk much more during our next episode about the legacy of Loudon, and we'll delve into exactly why Franklin would end up with such a scathing opinion of the man. Despite the British offensive missions of 1756 being somewhat stymied by the changes in leadership, it did not prevent the British from enduring another military setback in North America. Much as with the British, the French also found themselves needing a change in leadership. With Dieskau having been captured the year before, the French would hand the command of the army over to Louis-Joseph de Montcalm. As we are going to see, Montcalm and Canada's Governor General Vaudreuil did not see eye to eye when it came to how to carry out the war. Montcalm wished to execute a more traditional European style of warfare, whereas Vaudreuil understood the importance of Indian alliances. I bring this up because I want to make clear that it is not universally the British European commanders who are disregarding the importance of the Indians. The French were doing the exact same thing while awaiting the arrival of Montcalm. Vaudreuil used his alliances with the Ohio tribes to conduct a campaign of harassment against the frontiers of both Virginia and Pennsylvania. These attacks are the same hit-and-run style attacks that we have been talking about throughout this entire podcast. We keep coming back to them because the Indian tribes had long since realized how effective they were. Traveling often in small mobile bands, they would strike quickly and then get back out before any organized defense could be raised. <laughs> 
Forts along the frontier provided little meaningful defense and themselves were often the targets of the raids. The British forts were sparse enough along the frontier that they were hardly a deterrent from tribes who would just move around and between them to attack frontier towns. If the Indians could actually hit a poorly garrisoned fort, which there were plenty of, they could potentially take the fort, the people inside, and the weapons. We see this take place at Fort Granville in Pennsylvania, which was taken by Indian forces on July 30th, 1756. The attack and fall of Granville made the forts further west untenable and pushed the British defenses further east into Pennsylvania. For Vaudreuil, this presented him with several advantages. By giving the Indians a long leash, he was having to spend minimal men of his own to operate along the Pennsylvania and Virginia frontiers. Vaudreuil did little to rein in Indian aggression, something that would come much to the chagrin of men like Montcalm. These attacks also served as an important check on Pennsylvania and Virginia in the war. These raids were forcing two of the largest British colonies to use up valuable resources and manpower in protecting their own frontiers. This meant pragmatically that their ability to give resources for the greater fight to the north was largely hampered, with two major colonies basically knocked out of the fight for the time being at minimal cost to Vaudreuil he could place his focus on hitting the critical forts along the potential British attack routes. The fort that Vaudreuil set his focus on was Oswego, now under the command of James Mercer. Oswego had been the fort which the prior year had been the staging ground for Shirley's campaign along Lake Ontario towards Niagara. Vaudreuil recognized the importance of trying to destroy Oswego, as it was a critical point for the British allowing them easy access to either Fort Niagara in the west or Fort Frederick to the east. With the Iroquois returning to a state of neutrality following the events of 1755, suddenly the supply routes to Oswego were vulnerable. During the early months of 1756, attacks became more common, leaving the beleaguered troops back at Oswego increasingly isolated. Vaudreuil may have well hoped that by capturing Oswego, he would have been able to further cement the French authority over Lake Ontario. His hope was that by controlling Lake Ontario, the Iroquois would detect the way the wind was blowing and come into alliance with the French, a move that would have been absolutely catastrophic for the British, should it have ever materialized. By the time that August rolled around, the plan from Oswego had shifted from an attack on Fort Niagara to an attack against Fort Frontenac. To prepare this assault, Mercer had again begun building boats and was eagerly awaiting the arrival of reinforcements. The fort was becoming increasingly lightly garrisoned. Only 1,800 total people remained by that August, and Mercer was very much depending on those reinforcements, not just for the attack, but to better secure his own location. However, Recall that we are talking about events taking place in early August 1756. By this point, Shirley was out of power and Loudoun was just arriving in the colony. Earlier today, we discussed that the plans from 1756 from Shirley were quickly scrapped, meaning that no reinforcements were coming. Mercer was on his own. The French attack on Oswego came on August 10th, when 3,000 French and Indian troops appeared and quickly laid siege to the fort. Led by the recently arrived Montcalm, the siege of Oswego was not to be some prolonged affair. After four days of fighting, Mercer was struck by a cannonball and killed. The British, already dangerously exposed and now without their commander, quickly realized that they were outnumbered and that further resistance was pointless. Just like that, Fort Oswego was now under the control of the French. Montcalm was quick to proclaim this as being his victory likely to the great annoyance of Vaudreuil. Montcalm was, in many ways, the opposite of Vaudreuil when it came to using Indian allies. It was a practice that he disliked, as he often found them difficult to command. In what is going to be a bit of foreshadowing for next time, Montcalm was horrified when the French Indian allies attacked the British prisoners, killing several of them, before the French regulars could regain control over the situation. Montcalm was a professional European officer who had been trained literally his entire life in the military. He had earned his first commission at the age of nine. He was, 
to his very core, a man who cared about honor and fighting wars as a gentleman. Such a lack of discipline as was displayed by his Indian allies disgusted the professional Montcalm. One must also believe that this did little to convince Montcalm that utilizing Indian allies was a good idea in conducting the war. Unfortunately for Montcalm, despite the victory over Oswego, he was going to be unable to actually hold the fort. Ideally, he would have occupied the fort and had a permanent defensive base on the southern portion of Lake Ontario. However, the French soldiers were eager to get home for the coming harvest, and Montcalm recognized that his men were not going to happily remain at Oswego. Based on this, he decided that the prudent move was going to be destroying the fort and moving back towards Montreal. After everything was stripped out of the fort that they could carry, Oswego was completely destroyed. Losing Oswego for the British was undeniably crushing. Even without the French descending to hold the fort, it meant that the British had lost their main advanced base. Losing Oswego substantially reduced the ability of Loudoun and the British to strike against the French. Oswego had been the advance base for strikes at Niagara and Frontenac, and suddenly that option was gone. It was yet another defeat for the British in a war that has, to this point, been pretty much a string of defeats. This was certainly not the start that Loudoun had wanted. Well, ultimately, you cannot really place the blame for Oswego on Loudoun. The guy had literally just arrived a few weeks before. The loss seriously weakened his ability to strike against critical French forts. Well, the war in North America was defined by a changing of the guard in 1756. It was also a year when the war would expand past the confines of North America and into Europe itself. We are going to wrap up today by taking a quick peek at how the conflict in North America spilled out into a greater European theater. As always, I want to give the warning that I'm not going to go into much depth when it comes to the conflict in Europe. There are a few reasons for this, but mostly it is because someday I would very much like to wrap up the season and start talking about the American Revolution. Seriously, though, I'm going to keep my focus here only on those events that are going to really matter to our story. However, I want to point out that the French and Indian War, known in Europe as the Seven Years' War, was truly a global conflict. And just a note here on how I'm using the nomenclature. You will generally hear me refer to the war as the French and Indian War. If I, however, am talking about the larger conflict and not specifically about the North American theater of that war, I will refer to it as the Seven Years' War. By the end of the war, fighting is going to span from North America all the way across the globe to the Philippines. While North America was one of the major theaters of the war, this conflict is going to be expansive in its scope. In Europe, aggressions would officially begin in May 1756, when the French attacked the island of Menorca. Menorca is a small island off the coast of Spain in the Mediterranean, in the Belaric Island chain. It is the furthest east of the four major islands and is today controlled by Spain. In 1756, it also just so happened to be the main naval base for the British in the Mediterranean. The outbreak of a European war had hardly been a surprise, and indeed ever since those days back in 1754, the French had been preparing for the eventuality of a conflict. The French had spent much of their time since 1754, bolstering up their navy to contend with the British, who by this point had become a naval goliath. While the British maintained the advantage at sea, the French held the advantage in manpower back on the mainland, with nearly 175,000 troops at the ready. About half of those French troops were posted ominously along the French coast. The British, by contrast, only had around 30,000 in their army, meaning that in terms of actual manpower, they were at a rather significant disadvantage. It was enough of a discrepancy that the British would often need to use German mercenaries to help fill in the gaps. However, we are talking about Europe here, so of course we are also going to be looking at a complex series of alliances that are going to change the entire playing field. Before striking at Menorca, the French first had to be sure that Austria, a British ally, would not turn around and declare war on France. 
Austria was not thrilled with the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, which had ended the last war, and therefore was at least open to having conversations with the other European powers. It was the British, however, opening up talks with King Frederick of Prussia that got the Austrians to ditch their alliance with Britain. The Austrians were staunch enemies with Prussia and had no interest in fighting alongside King Frederick. When Britain and Prussia concluded a treaty in January of 1756, Austria turned around and entered into an alliance with the French. With an Austrian alliance now secured, France made their move against Menorca. The British would officially declare war on May 18th. Menorca would fall some six weeks later after a stiff resistance. Now, the French had little actual interest in some massive continental conflict. Yeah, they had troops hanging out on the French coast, making it look like they were preparing for an invasion of Britain itself. However, really, that is exactly what they were doing. They were making it look like they were planning on invading. In reality, they had no actual plans to invade Britain. The French had presumed that the war would remain primarily colonial in nature. You would have fighting in the colonies with little going on back on the European mainland. Anticipating a naval war, the strike on Menorca made sense, as it was a shot at the British Navy. Unfortunately for France, they had a couple of problems with this plan. The most pressing issue came when Spain failed to get involved. The Spanish and the French had long been allied with each other. Remember that whole War of Spanish Succession thing? Both countries were ruled by different lines of House Bourbon. For the French, they were relying on that alliance with the Spanish to help close the gap between them and the British in terms of naval supremacy. The problem for the Spanish is that they were operating largely untouched in the Pacific. They had been moving large amounts of silver from Mexico to Spanish-controlled Manila. Rather than traveling through the Caribbean and then across the Atlantic, which was dangerous at the best of times, the Spanish had been using the far more peaceful route across the Pacific. The last thing that the Spanish wanted to do was bring the other European powers into the Pacific to interfere with a Spanish silver trade. Spain, by this point, was an empire in decline, though to be sure they were still powerful. They controlled the Pacific and had zero intentions of inviting the other European powers into that sphere to challenge them. This would likewise mean that unlike in our previous wars with France, we are not going to see the Carolinas go to war against Spanish Florida. So if you are sitting around anxiously awaiting the moment when we follow troops from Carolina as they move on the Castillo de San Marcos, I regret to tell you that you are going to be disappointed. There is going to be no British invasion into Spanish Florida this time. Importantly, that meant that the colonies at least were only looking at a single front as opposed to their normal two-front war. The French were surprised by the lack of Spanish support and suddenly found themselves weaker than initially envisioned. While the French were busy trying to figure out their next move, it was the Prussians that decided to blow the entire thing up altogether when Prussian King Frederick attacked Saxony. Saxony fell under the protection of Austrian Queen Maria Theresa. And with that, those alliances kicked in full force. France had to join in the protection of Austria, while Britain had to come to the defense of Prussia. And just like that, despite any other intentions, Europe was now at war. 1756 was something of a turning point in the French and Indian War. In terms of actual campaigning, the North American theater was relatively quiet. Other than the capture of Oswego by French forces, there was a decided lack of major campaigns. The frontiers of the colony remained a dangerous place as Indian raids continued to torment the colonists. The real story in North America during 1756 was the change in leadership on both sides. Loudoun for the British and Montcalm for the French would take over and leave their fingerprints on the conflict. Meanwhile, a war that had started just a few years before in the remote Ohio country had now exploded into a conflict that would see fighting all over the globe a war that would reorganize European alliances and would help define the global balance of power well into the future. Next time, 
we are going to spend our episode looking at Loudon's expedition against Crown Point. It is a battle whose outcome is going to have major repercussions for both sides. Until then, I hope you all have a fantastic two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as we watch the British take another shot at capturing Crown Point. <laughs>